Okay, beautiful. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, your Monday night uh, Ayurveda session. This is this is a talk called Why Ayurveda, and uh, I really like that title for a number of reasons. One is that it encodes proper pronunciation into it. Uh, I have a lot of friends and colleagues who still pronounce the word Ayurveda, and and the the word is not. Ayurveda, it is Ayurveda, Ayurveda, that long A uh, gets us going. So, so why Ayurveda it helps us pronounce the word properly, which, um, you know, we can be nitpicky about Sanskrit pronunciation because it is so precise. Uh, English is not so precise when it comes to pronunciation. There's, uh, you know, there's so many different sounds for every letter and it's kind of random. Sanskrit, not that way. Very, very precise. Every single sound is prescribed. There's a specific point for the tongue in the mouth to make each particular sound. There's no guessing about how something is pronounced. And, and so we can be very, very precise in that way. Um, the, the theme of this talk then is also in that title. It's like, why, why is Ayurveda valuable to us? Is really like this, this overarching question feels really relevant because Ayurveda is, you know, this ancient system, this, this very, very old way of knowing that comes to us through the cultural lens of South Asia, right? It's, it's the Indian subcontinent and and really, you know, Afghanistan and, and that whole uh, South Asian area. And so why in 21st century North America or in 21st century Oceania, why do we care? Why do we care? What, what, what impact does this have for us? And, and so I wanted to give this sort of big picture overview in advance of this coming weekend where we're gonna do a deep dive into Ayurveda and, and it's very practical applications and, and how we can use it to be our own self healers. So uh, I know most of you, but just by way of introduction, my name is David McConaughey. I am an Ayurvedic doctor and a Vedic astrologer. I am an ordained minister uh, working on a doctorate in divinity. And so uh, this, talk comes in anticipation of this coming weekend, which is a, a intensive in Ayurveda, which marks the start of a year-long immersion, which we're calling the multidimensional immersion. And this is a year-long course in boundaries and belonging. And, and this, this phrase is really rich for me right now, this, this interplay of boundaries and belonging. And they're really two sides of the, of the same coin where without a boundary, there is nothing to which one can belong. And, and we're gonna, gonna circle all the way back around here, but one of my perception is that one of the core crises of our time is a crisis of belonging. And we see it show up in so many ways. One, you know, here in the U.S. there and, and around the world, there is a lot of xenophobia and, and racism, right? And, and people and this, this argument over who gets to belong here, who belongs on this land, who, who, is, who is a native, who really gets to, who gets to belong, who gets to be part of society, who gets all the benefits of society and who is an other, who is, is expelled and told to get out. And, and of course, this is this argument over belonging is to uh, act it out through boundaries. You know, there are um, asylum seekers who come to the boundary of the south border of the United States and are either allowed in or not. Uh, you know, and, and this plays out all over the world. We see um, in the crisis in Ukraine, there are, you know, a lot of the white Ukrainians are being welcomed and they feel like they belong and are welcomed into new communities, whereas black Ukrainians are not so lucky. And, and so, so this, this tension between boundaries and belonging plays out and on the geopolitical level. Um, we can also see it playing out in, in mostly amongst our youth 
And I'm thinking about like um, the explosion of awareness around uh, gender identities and, and pronouns and, and all the transition surgeries that are taking place, which have always been part of our culture, but are getting a lot of attention right now. And, and this is a question of, do I belong in my own body? Am I in the right body? Am I in the right mind? And, and this is a deep, deep longing for belonging that, that if someone doesn't feel like they're in the right body or the right, they, they're not, they don't belong to the pronouns that have been assigned to them, then this is, this is a deep personal crisis. And, and so the, and, and this crisis is sort of administered through these pronouns. It's like, well, you were born with, you know, this type of genitalia, therefore you are limited to this pronoun, right? You, you have to be called this. And, and there's this limitation that, that may or may not create belonging. And, and, and so again, the, this boundary and the belonging are, are in, in relationship and in intention. And, and so there's this movement among, again, it's mostly young people, but not at all limited to them, to use the language, which is previously a limiting factor, as to, to create their own belonging by choosing their pronouns, by changing their names, by, by choosing the way that they wish to be addressed, they create their own sense of belonging uh, by using a boundary. Nope, don't call me that, do call me this, right? And, and so we see this playing out. Um, the other uh, crisis that is sweeping the world and definitely the United States is around um, anxiety, depression, right? When uh, during COVID, there's, there's some horrifying studies that one in four people, 18 to 35, had suicidal thoughts. Uh, one out of four people, 25% of people had suicidal ideation during COVID lockdowns. Like that, and, and that didn't come out of nowhere, right? That, that's a, that, that, is a, that tendency has existed long before, uh, sort of under the ground, and those are just the mushroom spores popping up from the mycelia underground. And, and so know from personal experience that, that anxiety and depression, it makes you feel like you don't belong in the world and, and definitely not to yourself. Your, your own mind is attacking you. It's not a safe place to be in your own body or, or anywhere around you. And, and so, um, you know, one of the Again, the greatest limitation we have as humans is our time on earth. And, and so one of the ways that people can control and find, find some sort of belonging is by, by, you know, when we're having suicidal ideation, hey, I have control over that limitation, right? And if I can't find any other sense of belonging, well, hey, maybe I belong in the great beyond the beyond and, and in the after death life. So, so that's a very extreme example, right? And, and the sort of larger sort of planetary level expression of this crisis of belonging is, has to do with environmental destruction, where we act as if we don't belong to our own land, we don't belong on our own planet, we are at war with our own planet somehow. Uh, we, and, and this is only possible when we have the physically felt understanding that we don't, we are not a part of nature, that we are apart from nature as opposed to a part of it. Otherwise we would understand that burning down Amazonian rainforest is just like, you know, uh, inhaling carcinogenic smoke in our lungs all day, every day. Right. And, and so we, we, because we don't understand that we belong and are interwoven into the fabric of all beings, we don't recognize that what we're doing to the planet, we are doing to ourselves. And, and so there, there is this boundary between, well, I'm a human and that's nature. And, and these are different things. There's a boundary between us. And that allows me to do things that are actually inhuman, that, that no uh, naturally born animal on the planet would ever do to their own habitat, to their own environment. And, and thus we see uh, there's a big movement to escape the boundaries of Earth, right? We're going back to the moon. We're sending Elon to Mars or like whatever it is, right? We're, we're trying to escape the boundaries of our own 
planet because what we're doing to it makes it feel not safe to be there and, and to be here. And, and so this, this tension between of boundaries and belonging is, is playing out on, on sort of every scale throughout society on the planet. And, and there's, there is this crisis of belonging where, where we don't, it doesn't, a lot of us, the dis-ease that we feel um, sets, uh, creates the dis-ease, right? We, we don't belong to ourselves. We don't belong to our land. We don't belong to each other. And, and therefore, we don't know how to orient, how to relate to the world around us. And, and so this is where Ayurveda has a lot of support for us and a lot of wisdom for us. And it's timeless, universal perspectives can be really really helpful. And, and so just to, to stick with this, this tension of boundaries and belonging, like I said, there, without a boundary, there is nothing to, to which one can belong, right? And so we think of geographical regions. So, you know, I am a United States citizen, and that is defined very clearly by a geographical boundary and border walls at times, and, and it's very clearly defined. And whether I like it or not, I belong there, and, and, and I, there is only a United States to belong to because of those boundaries, right? Um, another layer of belonging or a boundary is language, right? There, we go to a foreign country, and there's a language barrier. And, and your level of belonging is defined by your ability to speak the language of the place. And that can be in um, a foreign country where they, they speak a different language than your native language. It can also be at like a physics conference or you know, at an Ayurveda conference where everybody's speaking in Sanskrit and, and your ability to uh, participate is limited by your, uh, or, or, or defined by your ability to speak that language. So the language barrier is, is one of these boundaries that creates either belonging or a form of exile or, or distance or outsider-ness. Um, our families and our communities, right? There are definitions of who is family and who is not family. And we treat our family differently than we treat our non-family. And, and how we define that determines, you know, I belong in my family because it's because it's this closed group and there's a group that's it includes and it's a group that it's not and and this is this comes back to Buckminster Fuller's definition of a sit of a system, which is one that has an inside and an outside. Uh, the any system has to have yeah an enclosed space and then an outside space so so this is this is what we're what we're talking about here, there has to be a boundary between those two in order to belong. And, and so these boundaries can be of any shape and size, right? They can be as small as every individual cell in your body. Every cell in your body has a cell wall and, and it, you know, keep invite some things in and keeps other things out. Right, it, and that's that's the definition of a healthy cell. A healthy cell has has its own boundaries and is part of the larger system. Right, uh, if a red blood cell decides, oh, I just want to be one with the whole body, and breaks down its cell wall and starts glomming onto the other red blood cells, that's not healthy unified consciousness. That's a clotting problem, and you might have a heart attack. Right, the, this this sort of thing, and and so. Uh, same that that boundary condition can also be as large as the planet itself. The planet has its atmosphere. It has its its boundary. And if you come in too steep, you get burnt up in the atmosphere. If you come in too shallow, you get bounced off. But if you come in at just the right angle, okay, cool, you can come in for landing. And so so this is the selectively permeable boundary that just like uh, the borders of any country are selectively permeable. They're strong, they're there, but if you have the right password, basically, the right codes to get through, you get to, to come through that, that boundary. And then of course, on a human level, we each have you know, the limitations of our own skin, right? This is the most basic boundary condition that each of us deals with on a daily 
basis. And, and we can say that it's the skin. I would argue that it is the bio field that surrounds us. We each have an electromagnetic field that is the shape of a sphere all around us. And, and really it's a toroidal field flowing all around us. And, and that is our most immediate boundary condition that we get to work with. And, and so if we can cultivate belonging within that sphere, we have a better chance at cultivating belonging at, we can zoom all the way down and we can zoom all the way out. And, and so this navigation, this working with boundaries and belonging and, and at which which scale of boundary condition do I belong? And if I don't belong at this one, maybe I belong at this one or at this tiny one, right? This is the main theme of this year long course. Uh, and, and so uh, the, the multidimensional immersion is all about playing with these, these boundaries and finding a deep sense of belonging to ourselves, to each other, to the natural living planet uh, and to the whole cosmos and the great mystery beyond the beyond. So this coming weekend, we're starting with a deep dive into Ayurveda. So I've been thinking about how does Ayurveda help us navigate these boundaries, define some boundaries, and create a sense of belonging. And, and so, so let's, let's get into that there. Just, just to pause for a moment before we go, go into some, some specifics about the Ayurvedic worldview. Does that make sense? Does, 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 that, does that spark any awareness or thoughts or feelings for anyone? Tina's given a thumbs up. Yeah. Um, one question that I would ask is, where do you belong and how do you know? And, and, and that second part is really the key question. Like, what does belonging feel like? How, how do you know when you belong somewhere? And, and if somebody has, has a response, I, I, would, I would welcome that. Hey, Heather, yeah. Just initially, I would say I belong to myself. Mm. And then the feeling of belonging is, from my experience, has come from like, where am I emotionally safe? Where do I feel accepted? Mm. Yeah, yeah. Where do you feel accepted? And, and where are you emotionally safe? And what immediately comes to mind for me is, Man, there have definitely been times where I was not emotionally safe with myself and I was not accepted by myself. And, and that's a tricky one to get out of. That's a really difficult place to be when it's not, because I agree with you fundamentally, like whatever else is happening. Yeah, I belong to myself. I belong here where I am because where else, I, I can't be possibly be anywhere else. And then if I'm not safe there, if I don't experience the qualities that I associate with that sense of belonging, oof, oof, that, and, and I see you nodding your head and I see some other nods coming through. That sounds like a, a pretty familiar experience. Yeah. Just real quick, would you say Ayurveda is in a way a science of learning to really accept all the different layers of ourself and harmonize them? Because that's kind of how I orient towards it. Yeah, yeah, exactly, I, I, exactly. And, and so one of the li most life-changing periods of my life is, is when I first started studying Ayurveda and learned about the five elements, learned about the three doshas and started to recognize them in myself, recognize myself in them. And um, I had recently gone through a breakup. And so I was 22 years old and I went through this breakup and ended up at living at an ashram. And this breakup broke something in my sort of like adolescent male brain. And, and so that happened and I started meditating every day. And all of a sudden, I it was like, I started meditating and all of a sudden I was like, oh, wait, I'm a total jerk. I'm super selfish and, and meditating is making me mean and selfish and, you know, just kind of an asshole. And, and it was one of the things that took me a minute. I was like, wait, is meditating 
making me this way? Or is it possible that I've always been this way and I'm just becoming aware of it? Ah, ah the, the young white male comes into some self-awareness about uh, all the all the things happening around him and, and maybe maybe he's playing a role in it, right? And, and so thankfully at the same time, I was exposed to Ayurveda. And, and so all these qualities that I was suddenly aware of, of being, you know, uh, aggressive, competitive, uh, impatient, uh, selfish, uh, these, 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 these sorts of qualities all of a sudden started to fit into an Ayurvedic paradigm where, oh, I'm not angry. I just have an excess of the fire element moving through me. And, and that shifted this perspective from this really vicious self-judgment, which again is just more of the fire element, uh, but this vicious self-talk of, well, you're just a bad person. You're, you're just impatient and angry at the world because, because you have an ugly soul. And so you just gonna have to learn to deal with it. And, and that's a very fixed position that, that was the source of some profound anxiety, some serious depression, lifelong, you know, lifelong anxiety and depression that that was related to this sort of sense of like well i'm just stuck the way i am and all of a sudden if i can understand myself as just one expression of the whole natural world which expresses itself through the five elements and the three doshas and i have my unique ratio of those five elements and three doshas then all of a sudden if if i'm angry that's just a natural expression of a lot of fire element and it becomes workable. It's not a fixed position. It's not something that I'm stuck with. It becomes the, the, the remedy becomes obvious and, and self-evident. So I can treat with an opposite quality. I can, you know, eat some ghee, take a coconut oil bath and, you know, whatever else go swim in the ocean. And, and so this, this is one of the key revelations that Ayurveda has to offer the world at the moment in, in my understanding is that it connects us and, and re, it reconnects us with the understanding that we are inextricably interwoven in the web of all beings, right? Everything in all creation is composed of the five elements and the three doshas, and we are no exception. We have our unique ratio, as does everything else, and and the elements without interact with the elements within and we we are interwoven and so it breaks down one of those boundary conditions right it, it breaks down the separation of i am something different than the rest of all creation and it can create this deep sense of belonging in the cosmos to the natural world and then and then within one's self, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure everyone here will have had the experience of being, you know, learned, perhaps learning about the three doshas and laughing as a total stranger talks about, you know, vata, and we just, we recognize ourselves. And it's like, oh my God, I'm totally like that. And, and how do they know? And how do they know that I'm anxious and I wake up at two in the morning every night and I, you know, get bloated after I eat. Those are two, those are three random things all disconnected. Ah, but, but in the paradigm of Ayurveda, there's this self-recognition and, and there, it, it's a beautiful system of pattern recognition, which in a world that is as chaotic and full of you know, overwhelming amounts of data and information, if we don't have a coherent system of pattern recognition, it's just a flood of data that can, that can overwhelm and, and shut us down and feels chaotic. But when we start to have these clear patterns, like, oh, this just fits over there. Okay, and there's too much of that. Cool, we can, we can bring in some of this to cool it down. Sometimes we're gonna fight fire with fire and you know, um, sweat out that fever. And, and so, but it, it creates this ability to relate with life as opposed to steal ourselves against it and, and build a wall instead of, you know, um, instead of that, that permeable boundary. And so, so yeah, and, and so the main sort of Ayurvedic topic I wanted to touch on tonight 
is, is the subject of Prakriti and Vikriti. And, and because these are our main touch points and, and really our, our core boundaries within the Ayurvedic paradigm. And so this word Prakriti points to our innate constitution. The, the basic ratio of elements that we are born with. And we all know people who are more like a rock and people who are more spacey and people who are watery and flowy and juicy and people who are, you know, have the fire in their eyes, right? And so we all have our particular ratio. And there's uh, um, intelligent people disagree. And there is a fruitful conversation to be had about when is Prakriti decided? The way I like to think about it is that it's at the moment of conception and it's in that moment of fertilization when your mom's karmic history and your dad's karmic history and your unique soul's karmic history come together and create this triangle of creative power. And, and that sort of sets the template. That's where you get your stamp of property and you get your particular ratio of elements, your particular combination of doshas that sets the template for the rest of your life. And immediately after that moment of conception, mom is either deeply in love or stressed out. She spends the next nine months taking care of herself, being supported or stressed out, nervous, you know, uh, running around, you know, not eating well, smoking, drinking, whatever. And already while the, you're in that embryonic state, the, the elements within are interacting with the elements without. The quality, the, the elements that compose the mother's body impact the embryo. The the elements that the mother's body interact with, interact with the embryo. And so already, way before we're born, we're already, we already have the chance to deviate from that essential boundary, which is our prakriti. And, and deviations from prakriti are known as vikriti. And, and this, this understanding is the core paradigm of how we practice Ayurveda. And, and so my job as an Ayurvedic doctor is to help you determine what is that property? What is that ideal ratio that you were conceived with? And in what ways has your life experience allowed you to deviate and, and break the, that, that basic boundary condition of, of property? And, and of course, you know, it happens before you're born. And then as soon as you are born, again, mom is still, she's breastfeeding or you're getting some sugary formula. Uh, you know, you live in a comfy, calm environment or you move every six months and you know, dad's around or not. And all of these things allow that natural alignment of property to deviate and, and create this vikriti, which, which is the, the sort of, um, yeah, the breaking of that fundamental boundary of, of property. And, and so um, understanding one's own property, it's like we, we can't actually understand vikriti without property, right? And, and this is where without a boundary, there is nothing to belong to. So we can't understand where we've gone out of balance until we've understood what, what balance even is. And, and so this, this is where, again, where Ayurveda provides this deep access point to the possibility for belonging to ourselves and embracing. So, you know, I once had a client who uh, started crying when I told her that she was kapha, read her pulses and, you know, she's tridosha kapha, right? Two, two, three is, is how we would define that. And, and she started crying because she didn't want to be Kafa. You know, she's this beautiful 24 year old woman who associated Kafa with being fat. And, you know, she's big boned and chubby and, 
and didn't want to be kapha because they're fat and lazy. And, and so she just started, she broke down crying. And, and so we had a whole conversation about like, actually, kapha is such a beautiful energy. And, you know, we talked about that maternal quality and how throughout most of human history, like the Venus de Milo is the, the like revered as the ideal of beauty. And she's super kapha naked out on her lotus flower or whatever, right? And, and you know, curvy women have been the ideal of beauty throughout all of human history. And, and so um, embracing the beautiful qualities of each of the doshas, each of the elements and understanding and, and finding a home within them. And if you're a kapha person and you feel like there's more adipose tissue than there should be, your best chance of working with that and coming to a sense of belonging and, and love within your own body is to embrace who you actually are and do kapha soothing things. Recognize that, okay, you're a kapha person. Let's do kapha soothing things. Let's work with that kapha dosha so that you can be the healthiest expression. You can be calm and loving and reliable and stable and supportive to your friends and family and, and strong and, and, you know, resilient and all these wonderful qualities of kapha. And, and that's where, you know, in, in my journey, this understanding of pitta dosha and the fire element was revolutionary. It's like, oh, I'm not just an ambitious asshole. I was angry all the time for no reason. Right. It's like, oh, I just I just have way too much of this fire element. But if that's not a bad thing, the fire element itself is not an, a bad thing. If I learn to work with it, oh, it gives me great clarity and precision and discernment and and enthusiasm. Uh, enthusiasm, uh, they say, is worth 10 IQ points. And, and that is the story of my life. I think, you know, I just, I get so excited and that takes me further than I would otherwise get to go. And, and so learning to embrace and understand my basic property, only then could I realize like, oh, this is out of balance. And, and once I understood the basic boundary condition of property, then I could see where that was being violated and, and return to some measure of homeostasis and find some sense of belonging within that. And that has time and time again, revolutionized my ability, uh, my, my capacity for self-acceptance, for self-love, uh, for, for feeling at home within myself, for feeling at home on the planet. Like when I go for a walk in the woods, it's no long, it's not a chore. It's an opportunity to feel like how my earth element relates to the rocks and how I can feel the, you know, the wind element within me is the wind element without and, and be this interconnected being as opposed to this uh, lost, lonely, abandoned, uh, you know, angry little boy. Right. And, and so that's sort of the, the personal piece that I wanted to communicate tonight is, is that sort of like, that revolution in awareness that I understanding Prakriti and Vikriti allowed me to feel more at home in myself, more at ease, more accepting. And the paradox is that the more accepting I became of who I actually am and that, that innate nature, that, that particular ratio of elements, the more I embrace that, the more easy it is to make adjustments. And, and move towards the more preferable expression of those elements of, of my constitution, as opposed to resisting like, no, I'm not like that. Shut up, leave me alone. I'm not frustrated. I'm not mad, you're mad, right? It's not very helpful. And, and so the more I, could, I can relax into that, the easier it, it becomes to shift. Um, my teacher, Alakanandama is fond of saying, um, how does she put it? Efforts at self-improvement which are rooted in self-hatred are rarely successful. Efforts at self-improvement, which are rooted in self-hatred are rarely successful. And, and so, so this is like our, our, our young Kafa friend who was so sad because she thought, well, I'm doomed to be fat 
now. It's like, oh, that's not at all what it has to be. And, and working together and, and just on her own journey, she, she, to this day, she's now a wonderful mama. She, she's, a, she's an amazing mom, which she always wanted to be and, and was like, has the natural capacity to be. And she's super strong. Like all her Instagram stuff is full of her working out, being strong. She's super fit and resilient and, and has endurance and, and she's awesome. And, and so this is, this is the, like, okay, if instead of fighting it, I can embrace it and actually just, okay, I belong here. Whether I like it or not, whether I feel like it or not, I belong in my body on the planet then I have the capacity to make skillful adjustments. And, and this is, um, going back to the, the theme of this year long course, is, is this idea of, you know, there are many layers of belonging, right? We talked about on the cellular level, the personal level, the social level, the planetary level, the cosmic level, there's all these sort of concentric spheres uh, which have boundaries and in, in which we can belong. And really we belong on every level, right? The, the yogis would say that the only thing that's real is Brahman, which is the, the ultimate sort of background within which all of these created containers exist. And so whether you like it or not, whether you feel like it or not, you do belong at every single sphere of existence, but some of them are easier to access than others, right? Um, Personal example, I often don't feel like I belong very well on the, the layer of the United States, right? I, I often have to differentiate between myself and the, the actions of the government of the United States, right? I, that, that's important for me to differentiate. And, so I, I, and very often in this, in this country, I just don't feel like I quite fit. I don't know where I belong necessarily. But, and so that can be uncomfortable. Um, sorry. Um, hey, uh, okay. I'm just going to mute you, Brooke. Um, so, so that's uncomfortable, but it's bearable and it becomes workable when I recognize, okay, I don't belong on this sphere, I'm not feeling belonging at this level, but I can I find belonging on a personal level? Yeah, okay, cool. Uh, I belong at, at this layer of existence. And okay, maybe I can find belonging within my, on a family level? Okay, yeah, pretty good, okay. And what about on a planetary level? Okay, yeah, I can really find belonging with the natural world on the living planet Earth. Okay, I can, so if I can belong at those three levels, sort of, which sandwich the, the national layer, okay, then I can, I can find some, at least an approach, I, it, it becomes workable, as opposed to this fixed condition where this is the way it is and I don't fit. Okay, but I fit here and here and here. And so, so that allows me to uh, have the capacity to interact in a good way. So, so that's, that's what we're working on throughout this year long course. And, and this is um, the beauty of Ayurveda in the modern world and the, the timeless universal principles that Ayurveda offers. And again, Ayurveda is the oldest continuously practiced indigenous system of medicine on the planet because of the unique geopolitical history and, and you know, archeological history of India, we have the records, we have the, the lineage passed down uh, at distorted at various times through history, but essentially unbroken from way, way back. And, and of course there are echoes of all other forms of indigenous medicine. You know, if we look at um, Native American, medicine, medicinal systems, they mirror very closely what we talk about in Ayurveda. Same with uh, Iranian traditional medicine. And if we go back into, you know, Celtic druidic herbal traditions, the, these wisdom traditions are full of very, very similar, you know, the, the Greeks had the, the three humors that were the four humors, depending on who you ask. 
just like Ayurveda has the three or potentially four doshas if you're listening to Shashrut. And, and so, so this, is, this is universal knowledge that comes to us in 21st century Earth through the cultural lens of South India. And, and so it's really important to recognize that, to honor that, and, and to, um, to respect that cultural lens. And it's a, it's a universal system that works just as well in India 5,000 years ago as it does on Mars 5,000 years from now as it does in North America right now. And, and so part of our task as, as emissaries of Ayurveda, of the living wisdom that is Ayurveda, is to study that knowledge and apply it as skillfully as we can based on our experience, based on the plants we see around us, the environment we're in, the, sea, the, the climate we experience, the people we're around, the, the nature of our environment and the nature of our own being, the task of those who study Ayurveda is to, is to, is to be attuned and to use the, the information gathered through the five senses to make skillful adjustments. And, and that's a universal thing because it, it's everything in all creation throughout all time and space is composed of these five elements. And, and when, if we can grasp that, then there not only becomes the self understanding and self acceptance and forgiveness of understanding, Hey, like I'm just a natural expression of the natural world, but we can have that for each other and see that, Oh, this person's behavior is not very pleasing to me, but Oh, it's not because they're a fundamentally bad person. It's because, Oh, I can see that there's excess pitta. And so they're a little sharper than maybe even they would like to be. And I can't imagine how they're speaking to themselves internally. And maybe there's something I can do as an external factor in their world to be medicine for them. And, and once we start to see each other as interwoven and with each other, then we can also see each other as interwoven in the natural world. And we don't judge the tree that grows all wonky and bent and sideways for being weird or you know for wanting different pronouns it's like no like cool what an amazing cool tree that like grew sideways and then spiraled up and then joined with this other tree like cool right and and so so this this perspective i believe is the medicine for our time on a very fundamental level obviously there's there's a trillion things that need to be solved and resolved and and worked with but it has to come from this basic understanding that that we are encoded into the cosmos and we are not these outside things acting upon it but that we are parts of a larger whole which are each larger hole is also just a part of a larger hole. And every hole is made up of smaller parts and it's all made of the same stuff at different scales. And, and if we can get to that place of belonging, where if I feel like I truly belong, then I have less of a need to make someone else feel like they don't belong, right? I, I remember, you know, when I was in middle school, I was the new kid at school every year. And so, um, my, my skill was to, I was good at sports. And so being good at sports got me in with the popular boys and the popular boys were bullies. And, and so in order to create belonging, I made other people, people feel like they don't belong. Whereas if I had just actually felt like I was fundamentally okay, I, I would have been okay. Like, Hey, cool. Like, you know, you're good at art. You're good at music. Tell me about that. Like, turns out art and music are awesome. You know, the best things, right? And, and now that I'm uh, an old man, sports just aren't that important. Uh, and, and so th this, is, this is, again, it's kind of a silly personal example about what can happen on a larger scale. Like, can you imagine if, um, you know, our, the previous president of, of this country really felt a sense of belonging, wasn't constantly trying to prove himself that he's powerful and he belongs and just was like, oh no, I'm okay just as I am. Imagine what a different world we would live in. Um, so, you know, I, 
I really see how Ayurveda has the response to so many of the epidemic conditions in our world, both on a physical level. I mean, we've got what uh, epidemic of obesity and inflammation and heart disease and, and diabetes and all these lifestyle conditions, which modern medicine for all its miracles in life-saving technology in emergency situations, modern medicine doesn't know how to deal with the day-to-day -day lifestyle stuff. So Ayurveda has got what we need in that realm. Uh, so we can save billions of dollars on healthcare and all, all that, right? But it also has the response for this deeper psycho-spiritual illness, which is the disconnection, uh, the, the, the border as opposed to boundary, the wall instead of the, the permeable gate um, between us and, and the natural world and, and each other. Uh, so, so yeah, Ayurveda as an access point for deep, deep belonging is, is really what I wanted to, wanted to talk about tonight. And, and so, um, the other question that comes to mind is, is like, okay, if we talked earlier about like, you know, you know, Heather said, you, you know, you belong because there's a feeling of acceptance and safety. And, and so my question would be, if and when you don't feel that acceptance, you don't feel that safety, what are some of your strategies for getting it? How do, how do you reestablish safety? If, so if you don't feel like you belong, how do you go about recreating, reestablishing some sense of belonging? And that can be to Heather, that can be to anybody who, who feels called to respond. I was just going to wait and let someone else share if they want to, <laughs> but if not, I will. Jump in. Maybe doing something that makes you feel comfortable. Hmm. For example? Or being with the people that makes you feel yourself. Ah, uh -huh. so, so seeking out, so if you're with people who are making you feel like you don't belong, seeking out some people that, that do, or, or perhaps even if you don't feel like you belong within yourself, finding family, friends who can, who can help remind you and, and they accept you. And so that can help you with self-acceptance. Am I, am I, am I getting that right? Something like that? Well, yeah. I mean, if you, if you are with company, it's always good to, I don't know, to be with, with your family or with whoever you feel comfortable with. And then maybe you can, I don't know, if you feel that imbalance, you can talk with them about it. And it's someone that really knows you so they can guide you. Mm. But that's, that's in a situation where, where you are not lonely. Mm. If you are lonely, well, maybe just an activity on, on your own, like watching a movie that you like or eating something that, you, that makes you feel good maybe <laughs> that's something I would do <laughs> yeah yeah beautiful beautiful well and 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 I love that and, and Heather will come right to you where and and the first thing you said was you, you know, find family and and that's an ex a great example of like okay I, I'm in my bubble and in this layer of belonging I'm sort of off balance and I, I don't feel like I belong here so okay let me go to a different layer let me go to my family layer and, and if this boundary isn't really working, isn't helping me create belonging, let's go to the next concentric sphere out, which is the family level. And they can help remind me that, oh yeah, no, you are our daughter. We love you. You, this is who you are. This is where you belong. This is, this is how we see you. Oh, okay, that can help. You know, if I was off balance like this, that can help re-stabilize me. And then, and then the other place you had, so that was going out one layer. The other place to go would be to go in one layer and go into the, you know, like literally like internally, like what, what's some, what's some nourishment? What's something I can take in and, and go internally that makes me feel good. And so for me, it's a, a bianga. Like if I give myself an oil massage, if I oil and sweat, I feel better every time. Or like, 
you know, whether it's the movie or food or, um, you know, there's lots of uh, things that we can take in that provide nourishment and a sense of belonging. Um, yeah, beautiful. Thank you. Heather, Heather, what you got? Yes, to everything you guys said, absolutely. And um, one thing for me is um, ever since I was a little girl when I didn't feel safe or like I belonged, because that was a big problem back then, mm. is nature. Nature is my go-to for everything. Yeah, yeah. Nature really is sort of the universal, isn't it? And, and there are definitely those amongst us that don't feel at home in nature, right? Nature's scary. There are bears, there are bees, uh, there are mosquitoes, there's a uh, pokey grass that stings your foot. You try to walk barefoot on the, but no, now you got a thorn in your foot and like, I don't belong in the wilderness, right? And, and so these, this is the relationship that, you know, leads to the desire to conquer nature to tame nature and make it so that we belong. It's a lot easier, you know, you go to Zion National Park and there are sidewalks all the way through the park because it's easier that way. You're not gonna step on a thorn on a sidewalk, most likely, right? And, and so that's a, a, you know, Zion National Park is also the most ADA accessible park. Right. And so it's amazing. So people uh, in a wheelchair can see this beautiful place. So that's amazing. And I'm not, I'm not I don't really mean to pick on it. But as an example, like we see what we're doing with the natural world is like nature is dangerous and scary and out to get us. And and so we need to tame it, conquer it, put strict boundaries upon it, pave it with cement, keep it. OK, no, here's a park. It's no longer a wild pasture land and forest, it's Central Park, right? And, and so this, this, again, the same thing that happens on an individual level in the psyche where it's not safe to be me and my own mind is attacking me can be perceived to be happening out on in the world in nature where I'm just going for a walk in the woods. Ah, here comes a cougar trying to chase me down, right? And, and the natural world, which is supposed to be the source of all life, is, is suddenly attacking me. And, and so um, the same issues repeat at, at, at every layer. It can be both a place of belonging and, and, a, and problematic, which is why we then want to have access to all the layers because we can usually find a sense of belonging on one. And that can be a, the stabilization point around which all the others can then orient. Yeah. Bailey, did you have something to, to say? I thought I saw you about ready to jump in. Yeah. No, you're good. I just, I was just gonna emphasize, is it Rocio? Rocio? Rocio. Um, just like the idea of comfort and and really like understanding like what does it actually feel like to feel comfort in my body, like in a place or with a person or in a few, like doing a thing. So yeah, I associate that often with belonging. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. There's a sense of, there's a sense of like ease, calm, yeah. confidence uh, yeah. from that place. You can be curious and courageous. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's a lot easier to like express your true self you're with old friends or you feel total belonging it's way easier to like take a risk right and tell a joke that you might not you a little bit of courage and or like ask a question ask a deeper question than you might ask a stranger where you're not sure what the where the boundaries are um so so yeah beautiful thank you um so just, i'm conscious of our time i want to honor our hour together uh and and just um an invitation that uh, this coming weekend, we're gonna spend six or eight hours cultivating the specific vocabulary and concepts and practices that are the practical application of all this. This is all like a little bit theoretical, right? Uh, boundaries, and it's a little bit uh, abstract, but we're gonna get into the very detailed specifics of 
um, how to actually work with this, how to actually move skillfully between layers and, and to work. And, and really this, this first season of the year long immersion. So year long immersion broken into six seasons. Each season is two months long. And this first season is two months of Ayurveda. So we're gonna do this weekend workshop, six, at least six hours of deep dive into Ayurveda. And, and then we'll spend the next eight weeks unpacking it, playing with it, working with it, troubleshooting, fine tuning, all of that. So if that's of any interest, you're most welcome to join us this coming weekend, just for the weekend, just to see what you get out of that. Um, and then, and then, but it would be wonderful to have you in the group with us. Uh, Heather will be with us, Rocio's with us, Hillary's with us. Uh, uh, it's going to be a, a beautiful journey. And, and so if you would like to talk more about that, then perhaps uh, this week we can get on a call. Um, I can, uh, yeah, let's get on a call and talk about whether it's a, whether it's the right fit for you right now. So with that, any concluding questions, comments, curiosities, enthusiasm, concerns, uh, how, we, how are we feeling? I feel enthusiastic about your metaphor of like finding the layers of belonging. I've never, I've never thought about it in that form. So mm. I like looking at it like that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I hope that I hope that's helpful. And and it, like as a paradigm, it really like at this point, um, I've broken my brain in a very interesting way where I can only see these things now. Where where it's you know at what layer am I operating and what what scale? How big is my bubble, right? And and if I'm taking an action, am I taking it from the state of mind where I'm at the center of the sphere of the planet? Or is it the center of my own sphere? Or is it even smaller? It's just the, the sphere around my tongue. And I'm not, my belly's not hungry. And you know, nothing's happening except I want something delicious on my tongue. And that that's a pretty small scale to make a choice, right? And and so, and then it, it really has shifted the way I perceive the world and, and has been a very stabilizing force in my life. And so no matter what's happening, even if I get into these old habits of being pretty vicious with myself, I can usually find some sense of belonging in my community, in the natural world, in the cosmos. And so that comes later in the year where we're going to do a season of astrology. And we'll talk about how, where do, where, how do we belong, not just on this planet, but into the whole cosmos uh, within us. So yeah, it's going to be great. So I, I'm looking forward to those of you, those of you who are already with us. It's going to be beautiful. And, and anyone who is curious to learn more, let's connect this week uh, so you can dive in this weekend and get the ball rolling right from the start. Okay, team. Wonderful to see you. Good to see you, Tina. What, what time is it there? It's, it's tomorrow morning. Oh, yeah, it's 11 a.m. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, everyone is super lucky. For those that haven't kind of met me, I'm in Australia and uh, Dave collaborates with a lot of my clients over here. He does a lot of um, work with them and he's going to come out to Australia in 2024 and um, all of my clients are so excited to uh, finally get a chance to meet Dave, as am I. Um, <laughs> so um, yeah, it, it's going to be an amazing experience this year long program. So well done, Dave. Beautiful. Thanks, Tina. Appreciate your support as well. And, you know, I've um, been talking to uh, Hillary and I have a mentor who is who's also in Australia on the sort of the business side of things. And and we've been talking about, like, maybe we need to do uh, uh, an Australian time zone version of the immersion as well. So because there's a lot of people down there, I think, would would like to participate. And, and if we can get it organized, um, maybe maybe that's a good idea. So anyway, seed yes, plant. Definitely explore that. Yeah. Yes, explore that option for sure. Yeah, cool. Well, thanks for being here, everybody. Thanks for chatting with me. It's, it's a joy as always. And uh, I'll look forward to seeing you very, very soon. Thanks. See you on the weekend. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. See you this weekend. Bye.